I have an exercise that they, I call it the bucket list, which is basically have people list out all those things that I mentioned that they enjoy in life and they love doing. And then the right side of each of those items, I have them write down the last time they did those things. Whenever I do that in a conference or in an event or in front of a team, I hear moans and groans because people realize I'm not doing things in life I enjoy doing. And of course, I'll ask them why. And they'll say, well, I don't have time. All right, welcome everybody. Today, I'm excited to introduce you to Michael Levitt. He is going to talk with us about burnout proofing your life. He has a really awesome story, which he's gonna share with you shortly. What really impressed me about Michael is his resume that has everything to do with being a virtual speaker, a therapist, uh, a top 20 global thought leader, all these different things he's doing. And more importantly, in addition to running a leadership group uh, that's both based in San Diego and Toronto, that he's doing all this in a four-day workweek schedule. And as I've talked with him, we've talked about managing time and ideas and, and trade-offs. From everything I can tell, he's the real deal. So I'm really excited to have him here. Thank you so much for joining us, Michael. Glad to be with you, Wade. Looking forward to our conversation. Awesome. So some people have a story that's good enough that I really don't have to say much. Yours is one of those. Maybe share a little bit about your journey. What got you so passionate about this work uh, and, and what led you here? I appreciate that. Let's go back in time to 2007. I was hired as a healthcare executive for a startup organization just outside of Windsor, Ontario, Canada. I am a dual citizen. I immigrated to Canada in 2004 and became a citizen in 2011. So I like to joke that I can vote and screw up two countries. And then I leave it there because you, you know, I don't want to irritate half of the population right now. So I just leave it there. I never say who I vote for. and I love everybody and, and we'll go from there. But I had previously had startup experience, you know, a couple of decades earlier in IT and all of that. So here I am, a new healthcare executive for this startup, never worked in healthcare before. So I didn't know what an autoclave was or anything like that. And I was tasked with recruiting physicians, hiring staff, and educating the community as to why our clinic was better than the other clinics in the area. So a steep learning curve for me which meant a lot of long hours. And basically the hours that I kept was basically 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. seven days a week because I was constantly on email, constantly talking with people, constantly working, researching, all kinds of different things. Now with the startup, eventually you get out of that habit and you can start scaling back your hours. But unfortunately, that didn't happen with me. Uh, the board that I worked with was very active. So a lot of questions and a lot of engagement and as is the community, cause it was a smaller community. So, you know, they, a lot of stakeholders in the mix. So it maintained those hours. And during that time, I really wasn't taking care of myself, uh, both from a physical standpoint or a mental standpoint and burnout crept in. Now I didn't know what burnout was, but I certainly had it based on looking back and seeing all the things that transpired. So you fast forward to 2009 in May, it was a Monday night and I was mowing my front lawn and I had an electric lawnmower because gas was expensive back then. And this mower was really bulky and hard to turn. So I mowed the first row on my lawn and then I turned the lawnmower to mow the next row. And I felt this incredibly sharp pain in the center of my chest. It literally felt like I pulled a muscle, it really hurt. I was having difficulty breathing. I was like, ow, that really hurt. And I couldn't finish mowing lawn. So I was able to get the lawnmower in the backyard. And then I went inside and I took some pain medication and the pain went away other than whenever I lifted anything up with my right arm. I'm left-handed, so I don't tend to use my right arm as much, but occasionally I'll lift things up with it. And every time I lift anything up with my right arm, that pain came back. It was minor. It didn't feel real bad, but it felt like, you know, literally when you you know, strain a muscle or something like that. It aches a little bit. So that proceeded on through that week. Thursday night of that week, I went out to dinner and a local restaurant had an all you can eat special. And I took them up on that offer. I ate all kinds of fried, greasy, really tasty, really bad for you food, washed it down with a few adult beverages. Great night. My belly was beyond full. So I get home, went to sleep and about 1030 that night, I woke up with that pain that I had on Monday night, but it was about 10 times worse. It felt like an elephant was literally stepping on my chest. At that point, I thought, okay, that's what you get for eating all of that food, dummy. So I took some 
antacids, finally was able to go to sleep. Friday morning, that pain that I was feeling every time that I lifted anything up with my right arm was persistent. It wasn't going away. So I went into the office and I was working for about an hour or so. And I'm like, okay, you know what? I need to talk with the doctor about this. This is one of the perks of working at a medical clinic. If you got a health issue, you just go over to the next room and, and say, hey, I've got this issue. So I mentioned it to our lead physician. He said, well, let's take a listen. So I'm literally in my office, lifts up my shirt, he, you know, listens with the stethoscope. He said, I don't think anything's necessarily going wrong, but we've got the EKG equipment. Why don't we go ahead and hook you up and we'll run a couple of tests just to make sure everything's okay. I'm like, that's fine. So I go back into the procedure room. Our physician is there, our nurse, one of our assistants and myself. And all of a sudden they're all laughing hysterically and cracking jokes. Now, the reason why is because their boss was taking his clothes off in front of them because I had to strip down to my underwear in order to run this test. So they're laughing. I'm beat red. I'm like, I can't believe this. They're making all kinds of harassment jokes. Of course, this is before Me Too and Harvey Weinstein and all that good stuff. So I, they were just being completely inappropriate and everybody was having a great time with it, except me, of course. And I'm like, all right, after they said, all right, all right, let's go ahead and get this test done so you can get back to work. So they hook up the electrodes and they run the test. They see the results and they're perplexed. They're like looking at it going, what is going on here? So they say, you know what? We don't use this equipment a lot. So we're going to run the test again. So I had to disconnect everything and reconnect everything back up again. And then they run the test again and they get the identical results. It's like, hmm, okay. So they sent the stuff off to Dr. Gina at Hotel de Grace Hospital in Windsor. And about 10 minutes later, I get a phone call from Dr. Gina and you know, they call the office and they said, tell Michael to get his butt to the hospital right now and he cannot drive. I had a pretty significant heart attack. Um, I had two blockages in my left anterior descending artery, which has a nickname called the Widowmaker because usually when you have a heart attack with blockages in that artery, you die. Um, well, that was in 2009. It is 2021. Still here. So very, very lucky. And even the cardiologist that performed the surgery to put the stents in that artery to open them back up told me, you don't know how lucky you are to be here right now. So needless to say, that was a wake up call. But that event kicked off what I refer to as my year of worst case scenarios. So 17 weeks after having my cardiac event, um, I go back to work to find out that they don't want me anymore. So they let me go. Now, let me remind you the time frame here. This is 2009. Anybody remember the Great Recession? I was in Windsor, which for those of you that aren't familiar with the area, across the border from Windsor, Ontario is Detroit, Michigan, where the auto sector was. The auto sector had to get bailed out by the government. Otherwise, GM, Ford and Chrysler, in all likelihood, would not be in existence today. Uh, they had to bail them out. They were all in deep trouble. So here I am. 17 weeks after a heart attack, now unemployed in an area that there really isn't a lot of jobs. So it took me several months to find one, ended up requiring a relocation up to Toronto. That was the only place I could find work because I was interviewing everywhere, you know, considered going back to Chicago where I'd spent some time uh, and everywhere in between and was able to find a role in Toronto. So I get up there and that was in April of 2010. So I was uh, let go in the fall of 2009, so it was several months before I was able to find a job. In my new role, I was there for a couple of weeks, and then around 4 o'clock, I get a phone call from my oldest daughter, who was 10 at the time, and she's crying. I couldn't understand a thing she was saying, and finally, I was able to get from them was the bank had come and um, repossessed our family vehicle. When you have a heart attack and then you lose your job and you're on medications that cost you $1,000 a month and you don't have any drug coverage, needless to say, your income is pretty significantly impacted. So I had to take, you know, pay for the meds, of course, to keep myself alive, but that impacted our ability to pay other bills. And we'd worked with our creditors and anybody going through any type of financial stress, I always recommend don't hide from the bill collectors, call them, keep and constant contact with them, figure out some type of way to pay something, even if it's five bucks, it'll keep them off your back. And in all likelihood, hopefully they won't be repossessing your vehicle. And I don't blame the bank. I didn't meet up on the, the agreement. You know, I didn't pay them. So they get to take the car back. So that was obviously a pretty traumatic situation. Then in May of 2010, so almost a year after the heart attack, 
found a place to move the family up to Toronto. So we did that and we get moved in. And after we're unpacking, we realized that we left the bunk bed ladder for our daughter's bed back at the old house. I was going back to that area uh, the next following week and I was going to visit some family and friends. And I said, well, I'll just swing by the house and I'll grab that and anything else we may have left behind. So I get to the house and after the visit and I open up the screen door in the front and I see the biggest padlock I've ever seen in my life. I've never seen this lock at Lowe's or Home Depot. Uh, and there was a small sticker on the door that said foreclosure. So over a period of 369 days or just over a year, heart attack that should have killed me, lost my job during the Great Recession, had my car repossessed and my home foreclosed. So basically all those things happened in a year. And all those things happened because I was burned out. I was making mistakes at work. I, my nutrition plan was breakfast, lunch, and dinner, ordering in a microphone and getting a brown bag handed to me after I paid for it, not exercising, irritable with people, just a complete train wreck of a human being. And thankfully had a second opportunity at life. And I took that opportunity. I said, okay, I have a choice here. One, I could play victim and blame everybody, which doesn't get you anywhere. Two, I could have said, hey, I'm Superman, even though I prefer Batman, but I, I'm Superman. I survived all of that. You know, I'm invincible. Not quite. Or I need to take a look at these experiences, heal from them, and then look at, figure out why did those things happen? What were my choices, my behaviors, my thought patterns that led me to burning out? That's the option that I took. And I went down that road in a lot of self, you know, self-love. You know, I think that's one of the biggest things with people that are stressed and burned out is they're hard on themselves. Um, and you got to love yourself because there's nobody you spend more time with than you. So you got to take care of yourself. In learning about burnout, what are the signs? What were the signs that I had in my life? Figure out those things. And then from there, design my life where I wouldn't burn out again because you hear people say from time to time, I've been burned out a few times. Well, I was burned out once and it nearly killed me. So I'm not willing to place that bet ever again. So I, you know, I did that. And then fast forward a few years, because it took me a couple of years to get that. I would say probably by 2014, um, after getting used to things and getting in this, you know, getting work back to work again and doing some things at work, that I really, okay, I'm doing really well. And I looked at my counterparts. So I went back in the healthcare sector. My parents wanted to have me committed. They're like, wait a minute, you're going back to the sector that nearly killed you? So I, I told them, I said, I'm confident I can do it better this time. And I did. Uh, and I was able to do a lot, but I did it in a very constrained time frame because it focused on what do I need to do right now and match that up with my energy levels. And again, this takes time to figure all these things out. But I was noticing all my counterparts were going down the same road that I did. And I thought, this is not good. So I started talking with them about it. And they're saying, well, I'm going to work through it, which a lot of people that are burning out think they're going to just work through it. And they work through it by working more hours. It's like, that's not what we mean by that. So I thought, okay, I need to do a little bit more research on this, start writing about it and coming up with some articles and researching and all of that. Started doing that and just started noticing that burnout wasn't limited to healthcare. I was seeing it in pretty much every sector under the sun. And I thought, here's an opportunity for me to take what I've learned, start writing about it, sharing the content, doing some things. So that's how I started. And then I realized, wait a minute, this actually could be a side business for me to do something about this and start building it up and all of that and launching a podcast. And fast forward to now, it's, it's been an absolute whirlwind of time. And you, you'd mentioned all the things that I do and I've done but yet still get to do them in this, you know, infamous four day work week. It's because you, you have to understand what's important for you to work on. Of course, that can shift from time to time. And when is the best time for you to do that? Because a lot of people say, all right, I need to do this, 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 and this. That's great. Okay. Well, when are you going to do it? Well, I'll do this on Monday, this on Tuesday. And I'll ask them, okay, what are your energy levels like on Monday? Not good. Okay. So you got a heavy task that you're going to try to do on Monday. How's that going to look? It's not going to be comfortable. So you have to get into really understanding where your energy levels are, your interest levels are, a variety of other things 
external and internal and line those things up. And that takes time. And the best way for me to figure out those things was to journal, to figure out, okay, what did I eat today? What are my energy levels today? How am I feeling? Any weird aches or pains? How did I sleep? And because a lot of people say, well, that seems like a lot of busy work. It's like, yeah, but you're responsible for one system. You know, if you're in engineering or manufacturing and you, you look over an operation or a machine or things like that, you're responsible for that. That thing needs to run perfectly in order for you to be able to do the things you need to do. Same thing goes with you. So you need to figure out where things are and you can notice some trends if you notice, okay, I'm not sleeping well over a period of time. Okay, what's going on? What's changed from before? Or... Every time I go out to dinner on Thursday nights at my favorite Italian restaurant, I wake up in the morning on Friday and I'm lethargic and got a lot of indigestion or acid reflux. Maybe you have a food intolerance to what you're eating. And so there's, you basically have to, I mean, we've heard the phrase in recent years called biohacking, and there's a lot of research going on what our bodies do and the types of inputs we have and how it impacts things. And I'm a firm believer in studying the body from that standpoint, because if there's a way that we can figure out how we can be our optimum best, then we can set up our days to match up with that. And then the work just flows. So, I mean, that's, that's a long-winded answer to where I was, how I got to today, and some insights on, on the four-hour um, or I wish it was four hours. Uh, some days it's four, um, but the, you know, the four-day work week. Awesome. Thank you. So question, you know, a lot of people think that they're going to know when they're going, they're experiencing burnout. It's the same way people, everybody thinks they have a good sense of humor and a lot of mm -hmm. people don't. Uh, nobody realizes when they smell <laughs> for the most part. What would you be saying to somebody or what did you say to those people that were in the same phase that you were in? How would you recognize it? Because you mentioned awareness and once you're open to awareness, it comes a lot more quickly. Well, it's there the whole time. It's like tuning into a radio station is my experience. And for those of y'all really younger radio stations where we used to listen to music, uh, but, but anyway, um, use a tune, not a button that pre -programmed. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. But plain and simply, there's this sense of once you're aware, like I've changed my diet over the years and you become aware and it's a lot easier, but how do you overcome? Because there's a certain, at least in my experience, a certain level of ego and arrogance that comes with, well, they keep telling me that I'm awesome. They keep giving me more work and anybody who's an entrepreneur knows where this goes. You just get more work, more work, more work. And it says, like the guy said, what, weekend at Bernie's? My dad worked really hard. They just kept giving him more work. And that's what happens. How do you identify that? And how are you able to help people recognize that when everything else that's external is saying, you're doing awesome? Yeah, key things in the signs that I commonly see with people and teams that are burned out are, one, the sleep habits. Are you, are you having difficulty sleeping? And has this been going on for a short period of time or for a long time? And I, I recommend a lot of work around that, you know, which lies into simplistic things, or they sound simple, but they might be difficult to implement depending on financing and whatnot is make sure your, your mattress and your pillow is the most comfortable thing you've ever slept in. And that means if you need to spend a lot of money, do it. My mom uh, just recently moved and she bought a new bed and she bought, she paid, I think over $3,000 for the bed. I forget what brand it is. They don't sponsor your show. So I'm not mentioning them, uh, but she paid a lot of money for that bed. And I was justifying it to her because she, you know, she'd always would buy some mattress that'd be, you know, 500 or thousand or whatever, but she paid, you know, a ton more for that. I told her, I said, where do you spend the most consecutive amount of hours in your day? For most people, it's going to be their bed. And you're, that's where you're going to be for hopefully seven to eight hours. Don't you want that to be enjoyable? Don't you want that to be rejuvenating and restful and helping you heal from the damage we do to ourselves on a daily basis? The answer should be yes. So that means spend the money on that even with the pillows. Sure, you can buy a pillow from a store and pay three bucks for it. It's not gonna be a great pillow, or you can pay $50, $100. There's a guy in my condo that I saw a few weeks ago, and you know he bought a new pillow for his wife because they both like the same pillow. And he said, yeah, I paid $260 for this pillow. Now, a lot of people say, $260 on a pillow, are you crazy? He sleeps 
amazingly, he's one of the most gentlest, happy-go-lucky people I know. And it's not a shot. It's he's the real deal. He is just go lucky. Even during this pandemic, he's been up spirit. Why? He's getting good night's sleep. He's restful. You know, yes, these challenges that we're facing are difficult. So sleep's a big thing. We, we've talked a little bit about nutrition. I recommend people work with a nutritionist or a dietitian to figure out what your food intolerances are. You may not know. For years, I was unaware that I had a potato allergy. I've got Irish heritage. That's kind of a rude joke if you think about it, but I have this intolerance to potatoes. Now it's not, I need an EpiPen. I'm going to you know, be sick or potentially die type of situation, but depending on how the potato is prepared, it might give me a little bit of nasal congestion and whatnot and never clued into that until I started getting some tests and doing some things because there's certain foods that aren't good for you. And that doesn't mean that they wouldn't be good for me. It's finding those foods out and specifically with the focus of what are some good foods that you'll enjoy eating that give you natural energy and not the five hour booster shots or the, you know, the, the six bucks at two o'clock kind of thing. It's you want the natural energy. So that way you don't have the big spikes in your energy level. So you can find those things. Um, another thing too is and I see this a lot with people that are burning out is they cut out things in life that they enjoy doing because they're so busy working. Um, I don't have time. Well, we all get the same 24 hours a day. So it's up to you on how you design that. And that's something you really need to master is how you spend your time. But when people start cutting things out of their life that they enjoy doing, that is a huge red flag for me. It was stop going to baseball games. I was a season ticket holder. So, Tickets were already paid for. The parking was already paid for. Even had a meal pass. So my first, you know, I get a couple of hot dogs and a beer. That was paid for. I could literally go there with no money in my wallet and go to the game, consume, leave, and not spend an additional dime. And I've loved baseball since I was a little kid. My first career in public accounting was because of baseball cards. Because I opened up a pack of baseball cards at this little general store in northern Michigan and pulled out the first card I pulled out was Jerry Rice. He was a pitcher for the Pirates at the time. And I looked at the back and I'm like, what's with all these numbers? And was able to figure out how they calculated an earn run average. And then with hitters, how they did the, the batting average and, and all these other things. And I was fascinated with that. And it actually gave me kind of a path for my first career in accounting. Uh, and so I've loved baseball since I was a little kid, played it, um, not really well, but I did play it. And I remember my dad, because I'm left-handed, as I mentioned before, dad handed me a baseball, but unfortunately I threw right-handed and he's like, okay, throw with your left hand. And I'm trying. And it's like this, the pennage was just not working. And he's like, all right, try the same form. And he's trying to think, I know what dad was trying to do. He's like, let's see if you can pitch left-handed because if you can pitch left-handed, we're going to be investing in you throwing fastballs at 90 something miles an hour, because you will be rich because you will be a left-handed baseball player. And even if you're lousy, you're still going to have a job well into your, you know, later adult years. So it's like, but unfortunately this thing is useless when it comes to throwing a ball. So such is life, but those are some big signs, you know, the, the sleep then you know, not eating well and food intolerances, uh, and stop doing things that you enjoy doing. And if you notice people aren't going out as much or look like a zombie all the time or just not their normal self, those are some huge, huge signs to look out for. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that, you know, I don't know how females are raised and what message they received as much because I wasn't raised. I was raised as a male and, and I see them as a father and I, you know, I'm very sensitive to that as with my daughter and I coach her volleyball team and you know, but I know as a male, there's a lot of messages, at least I've received and, and we received in the Western world or however you want to word that, of suck it up, deal with it, be tougher, be stronger, uh, even without even going into the don't cry, don't have emotions, that sort of part. Right. But just this idea that it's a test and, and granted, there is a spectrum. Uh, we happen to live in, in Naples, Florida. So as I tell my kids, you, you're growing up in a bubble. It's not real where you grow up as far as compared to the rest of the world. I mean, it is real, but it's, you know, there's a lot tougher situations. And I'll even find myself sometimes saying, okay, but that doesn't mean that they become superhuman. It's just, I want them to be aware. So I explain to my kids this way. I say, look, 
the reason why I say this is I want you to understand that this is about as easy as it gets, not to put you down, but to help you realize that if you're waiting for it to get easier or better or more comfortable before you're going to be happy, okay, we need to talk because mm. there are people who have, you know, have a lot less and it's more materialistically, of course, uh, or comfort wise. And they're still happy because of course they're happy in other dimensions of their lives. And you and I both know there's many dimensions to life, not just money and, and power and, 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 and attention and, and approval. But again, as males, that's so much of what we're brought up with. I was a dorky kid with braces and a trombone and a butt cut. So how did I make up for it? I, I played pretty good at sports. I, I, my dad helped me learn. My dad was an athlete. And so he made sure I'd be taught how to skip. And it was like, okay, I have to do this. And I think sometimes it becomes so difficult for us to realize, but to your point of giving up things, I remember one of the least wise decisions I made as a young father was not a young father, I was old, but as a new father, <laughs> Mm -hmm. was that I gave up playing beach volleyball for about five or six years. That's my love. I do that every Friday now. Mm -hmm. And I did it because I thought, I didn't intentionally say, okay, well, I'm going to do this to, to prove I'm a martyr or this and that. But I did it in the sense of, okay, well, if I'm a, if I'm a great father, I'm going to give everything I have to this. I don't have time for volleyball. That was the story I told myself. Yeah. And then once I started back playing, literally six years later, I had been playing for about maybe three, four weeks in a row during my less busy season. And a friend of mine had challenged me, well, wait, keep that going all year long. And more than that, I told my wife one week, I said, ah, you know what? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to play this week. She says, why? I said, oh, I've been playing a lot and, and you're, you're doing house stuff and this and that because she had paused her career to be a house mom. She said, Wade, please go play your volleyball. You're a lot less happy when you don't. And she didn't say it that way. She said it a different way. I'll just keep it that way for now. It sounds nicer. And she's like, look, you're missing out. And as a male who's an athlete or just a male, and maybe this is females too. So again, I'm not looking, it's just, just my experience. I need a release. I don't like working out. I don't like running. But if you put a ball in front of me, I'll run for hours in the hot sun in 90 something degree weather, no problem. But if I don't get that, for me, the burnout wasn't as much energy as it was me becoming an a-hole and, mm -hmm. and, and lashing yeah. out and releasing like, why this? Why that? I'm yeah. working so hard. Look at me. I'm doing this. Why are you not doing your part? And then you sometimes find yourselves if you're a parent and you're like, if you look at the outside, like, dude, you're talking to a, a four-year-old mm. or a six-year-old, you know, come on, man. Even, even kids are 12 and 14 now. There's still certain things like, and my wife has such a great perspective of Wade. They're at their stage. Let them enjoy where they're at. And, and there's no need to put more pressure on them. Yes. Keep some perspective. We don't need every single new gadget to be happy. And yet at the same time, that expectation, you mentioned being hard on ourselves. And I think most entrepreneurs, so if you're listening to this, chances are you're, you're an entrepreneur or aspire to be an entrepreneur. In addition to the fact that we're hard on ourselves, the market is not so gentle either. So right. you can be gentle with yourselves and the market can kick your butt. How have you found, you mentioned a little bit about self-love mm -hmm. to a lot of people that sounds either hippie-ish or new yeah. age-ish or whatever. What did that look like for you? And so for those guy who likes baseball, drinks beer, eats hot dogs, or maybe used to, maybe I don't know your dietary thing today, but not what as did much. That look yeah. like? What do you say? Yeah, not as much. Yeah, yeah. Not as much. But what, yeah, did, yeah. what, did, what, what would self-love look like to you? Uh, and how did that shift for you? Yeah. I, when people hear self-care or self-love, they think yoga, meditation, moments of Zen. And, and yes, those are components of it. But my definition of it is things you love to do in life. And I commend you for going back to volleyball because parents, all new parents, and even parents that have been parents for a long time, think that they have to sacrifice things from their life in order to give their kids a better life. And I completely get that. I understand that. We, we hear that all the time. I, I could even call it programming maybe. But you know, for every parent out there, your children deserve a happy parent. And for you to be happy, you should be able to do things in life you enjoy doing. Don't put them off because if you wait and you have several kids and it might be a 25 to 30 year type of window, all of a sudden you start having kids in your 20s or 30s. And finally, the, the last one moves out. And now you're in your 50s or 60s. Uh, unless you've been kind of keeping pace and doing things all along, you're like, well, I haven't played volleyball in 25 years. Um, it's going to feel that way when you get out there in the sand, because 
you're going to be like, wait a minute. No, this is working. My brain's saying do this. Body's going, who this? I don't know. What, what are you asking me to do? We don't do this anymore. So self-care is doing things in life you enjoy. And they can be as simple as nature trail walks or volleyball or riding your bike or running or going on, you know, like I said, nature trails or shopping or having coffee with your best friend, going out to the pub, watching sporting events, you know, you know, golfing, reading, writing, watching television, anything that you like doing that when you, when you think about it, just, you know, like, okay, there are things you like doing. You mentioned it. You think about those. How do they make you feel? They typically should make you feel good. And often a little, little side note here for all of us that like to multitask is most of the things that we enjoy in life to do are very singular in nature. You can't play volleyball and play on your iPhone while you're trying to get ready to hit the ball because you're going to be doing this. Next thing you know, it's going to hit you in the head. It's going to hit the sand. And well, you know, the rest of your team is going to be like, what are you doing? Uh, So that's one of the beautiful things about a lot of the things that I see people because I have an exercise that they call it the bucket list, which is basically have people list out all those things that I mentioned that they enjoy in life and they love doing. And on the right side of each of those items, I have them write down the last time they did those things. Whenever I do that in a conference or in an event or in front of a team, I hear moans and groans because people realize I'm not doing things in life I enjoy doing. And of course, I'll ask them why. And they'll say, well, I don't have time. And they better not have an iPhone when they say that to me. So I say, okay, let's, let's take your iPhone. Let's go into screen time for a moment, shall we? What are you averaging? Oh, six and a half hours a day. Okay. Do you think you could carve out a half an hour to go have coffee with your best friend? Just, Just 30 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it and start doing those things and scheduling those things. So when people think about self-love or self-care, that's what it is, is doing things for you. And I know, especially if you're, you know, a giving person, you have a lot of empathy, you want to help others. You want to be the best parent, the best spouse, all of those things. Great. But how you can do that is be the best version of you. Take care of you first. When you do that, like your, your wife said, you know, you're, you're less angry and irritable. And that is another sign of somebody that is burning out is if they're angry, irritable, barking at the television because this candidate said this, or this one said that, or this or that. Um, when you, when you realize like you're always angry and irritable, that is a normal, you know, build a really big red flag. Now there are some people in life that are just naturally grumpy. And you can run all the health tests on them and they're a healthy specimen. They're fine. They'll live late into their life. They're just curmudgeons in life. So be it. That's great. Most of us, however, don't tend to fall in that camp. And we tend to be more even keeled and happy-go-lucky or at least pleasant. But when we turn, we start getting more irritable about things. That again is a big sign of burnout. And it leads into you know, making sure you take care of yourself, eating better, sleeping, doing things in life you enjoy. Um, there's, there's plenty of time to do things and work will fill up your calendar without you know, keeping it in check. Uh, if you want to do a four day work week, then you have to be really, really good about understanding how you work, what needs to be done, how long it ne- needs to be done. And also, you know, keeping those interruptions in check so you can focus and deep work on those things. You know, Cal Newport wrote that book, Deep Work is a great book. Um, but just focus on those things because then you get things done. And for us entrepreneurs and successful people and the type A personalities that are driven, they want to make a big impact in the world. It's really easy if we finish something quick to go, awesome, I got that done. What's next? Well, you need to take some time to not do anything. And I know for a lot of us, that is a really hard thing to learn, to not do anything and just stare at a wall. Uh, But the reason you want to do that is it gives you time to reflect. It gives you time to look at how did that work? Why, you know, why did I get that done faster than normal? Is there anything that I learned from that, that I could apply to other things that I'm doing that can help me be more effective or efficient or more aware? There's all kinds of different things you can look at, but as with anything, you want to constantly improve and learn and also, but that takes time and to do that. And it also takes the time of you not doing anything because it's very difficult for you to be doing something 
and then trying to learn something new at the same time, your, your brain, while it has a split in it, it doesn't work that way. So, and that causes undue stress and prolonged stress turns into burnout. So uh, it's, it's one of those things where the, you know, the self-love and the self-care is critical and it doesn't need to involve yoga or meditation. If that works for you, by all means, go for it, um, do it. But um, just doing those things in life that you enjoy doing will make you happier and you'll enjoy things and you won't get as irritated about the other things in life that, you know, there's no shortage of things to get irritated about. Um, but, you know, you, you want to approach it in a different mindset because then that way you won't be stressed. Yeah, I think I think of two things. One, there's a, an idea, or I forget, I'd say a quote, but I can't remember exactly how he said it, but there's a book, a mini book, it's probably about literally 45 pages. It's like a three by five book by a gentleman by the name of Stuart Wilde. And it's called Life Was Never Meant to Be a Struggle. And he talks about the difference between effort and struggle. He says, effort's natural. Mm -hmm. He says, think about a tiger. A tiger, if it's going to stalk its prey, has to exert effort to, you know, attack the prey and kill the prey and eat. Mm -hmm. He says, but for the rest of the day, it doesn't sit there like, oh gosh, am I a good tiger? Do the other tigers love me? Do I, it doesn't sit there doing that whole thing or can I do this? Can I, I don't know if I can do this. I'm not sure. All those things, those doubts that I need to be a good enough tiger. I need to kill 10 things today. Just all these other things that we have. And I even think of, for example, you know, I've never met a turtle that has two shells. Why would you need two shells? You need one shell. You're good. And the other thing I think of is, and, well, and th that means basically that that just aligns to what's natural. It's, it's not natural to, and again, there's nothing wrong, but I've read of different people. I remember in what, in Tim Ferriss's book, The Four Hour Work Week, he talks about how so many of his friends, one of his friends he mentioned that has multiple houses. He says, it's a pain in the butt. I have all these houses and I'm working hard so that my staff can live there nine to 10 months out of the year and I barely live there. And so the sense that you know, more is better, I think, is, is, a, is an interesting one. And then I think of one of the things I learned from Dan Sullivan of The Strategic Coach, and he just talked about something very simple uh, when it comes to uh, you know, having time off. And he has this concept of free, fo free days and focus days and buffer days, days when you get to do certain things. And But he talked about how most entrepreneurs think that they have to earn time off. Like if I do something good, then I deserve a day off. And he said, when right. you flip that and realize that, no, you take a day off, not even because you deserve it. For, so forget even all the, you know, self-esteem, I'm okay, you're okay. But you take it because that's what you need to actually perform really well in the other days. So even if you take the, the judgment out of it or the self-criticism out of it, you're not going to be able to do that. If you, you know, if you don't get the rest, you can't perform. And again, the, the analogy I always use is think about athletes in the physical domain we know that if somebody's injured and the big game's coming up we don't tell them to practice the next five days we tell them to rest we know that but somewhere in our mind we've told ourselves that our brains don't need rest right. that they can just go on and on as if any other any other muscle we know needs a break we know if somebody's had a lot of emotional things going they've lost a lot of people and we talk about their heart you know we don't know if emotions truly reside there but we say oh wow they've had a lot go on they're they're, they're emotionally tired and yet somehow we think that a five hour energy drink or something and not to knock their brand, but or any drink of that nature or caffeine or Coke or whatever is going to reset the brain. It might reset the, the you know, might fool the brain into being in a hypervigilant state. But as far as the rest and that cycle of you know, resting in the brain, getting the time to break, you know, to take a break, uh, that just doesn't happen. What would you say you find that people find, you mentioned sleep and I know whenever I'm getting better sleep, like right now, um, you know, I just even because of what's going on with COVID, I'm extra sensitive. I'm allowing myself that extra sleep. Sometimes I'm sleeping an hour or two more than I normally do. I've been doing a little bit of coaching with my kids' teams at the Y, I wear my mask and whatnot. But so I'm in the sense of saying, okay, whereas normally I'd say, okay, wait, 5 a.m., let's get up. I'm actually going the other direction saying, you know what? not too sure what's going on with this COVID thing. I don't, I'm not a doctor. I, I don't know. And a lot of doctors still don't know. So I'm erring on the side of more sleep. And I, I can say that particular decision has never really faltered me. I, I mean, assuming I make my appointments and whatnot. Um, but how does a person identify that? And then how do you tie that into the thing that once, if you allow yourself that time, something else you mentioned is to then not over schedule your future. Cause sometimes we think yeah. the future seems so it's, oh, with everything, we'll get to everything tomorrow. That's so, we can fill up our whole thing. And yet today we realize, oh, I can't get to everything today. I can only get about two, three things done today, but tomorrow I've got 10 things planned. 
because somehow magically tomorrow it's going to happen. How do you help people with that kind of thinking, not only in honoring uh, the difference between struggling versus working and, and balancing mm -hmm. that, but also realistic expectations about what can be done without, let's say, going soft. Some people say, wait, wait I don't, I don't want to be soft. I don't want to, I want to make sure I don't lose my edge, um, right. but I, I don't want to be on edge. I think a couple things. One, you know, I always encourage people to you know, have their, you know, their must do tasks, their to do list and not have more than two or three things on that for the day. They can have a secondary list of, okay, this is the, the, you know, the CVS receipt length of things that I need to do, but I'm going to just do two or three things a day and do a hard stop on that because again, it gives you that time for reflection and, you know, the stuff that, you know, Dan Sullivan talks about and, you know, to in, in design your days. Like for me, you know, I'll peel back the curtain a little bit as far as how I spend my weeks, you know, Monday, because I do a lot of public speaking. So Mondays it tends to be a research day on events and, you know, looking, you know, anywhere from six months to a year, maybe two years out on different events and, you know, talking with event planners and whatnot. Tuesdays tend to be intro calls or follow-up calls, or if I'm a guest on a show, for example, you know, those are days. Wednesdays are the day that I do my podcast show, typically. And if I have to waver a day, I've got elbow room because I have elbow room in my schedule to do it. But Wednesdays tend to be the day for that. Thursdays and Fridays, I don't schedule. So I know this is the four day work week. I've, I've mentioned three days. So like, wait a minute, three, how in the world are you doing three? Well, I'm not, but I leave Thursdays and Fridays unscheduled. That way, if something comes up on Monday, Tuesday, that needs to be addressed this week, then I can slot it in. I tend to aim it for Thursdays um, to keep Friday that, but if for some reason Friday ends up being, then I go, okay, well, let's look at Thursday, make sure Thursday isn't overloaded because that would bleed over into time. You know, sometimes it's going to happen. We're not perfect, but if you can do that, then you block it in that way. Then you have those days for creativity. It doesn't mean I'm not working. It means I'm being creative. I'm thinking about different things. I'm going, okay, well, how do I want to do this? What, what are some new initiatives based on conversations that I've had that I can do or new partnerships or collaborations or a variety of different things that are you're going on in my world. So you look at those things, all right, what, you know, how does that look? Where, how would that fit into things? And I think we, we talked about in, in the pre-show, you know, my, my PR rep, it's like, okay, I want to do this and this. I'm like, when, you know, and it's like, it's the opposite. And you know, when people ha you know, have a PR person, they're like, oh yeah, put me out there. I want to be everywhere and all that. I'm like, I don't want to be everywhere. I, I, because I don't have the capacity. Now I know other people in the industry. I know a lot of people that do similar things to me or different, or, you know, can collaborate and whatnot. But for me, I'm like, oh no, 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 no. That that's like turning on both faucets and, you know, both sprayers on the shower and you get hosed really quick. It's like, you don't want that. It's like trickle please within things and plan it out. You know, I can say, all right, well, we're going to do a campaign and we're going to do the campaign and, you know, two or three months out plan it, get it there. Then that way I know when I'm scheduling things, don't go crazy booking things in April because that's when the PR person is getting you on all the media stations. And when they say show up at 7.45 a.m. on the morning show on KUSI in San Diego, you better be there. Um, so you can't like, well, I got another conflict. No, 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 no. If you're, if you're getting on media time, it, they control the schedule. So, but you have to have that elbow room in there. And we, as entrepreneurs, love filling up spots. We see a blank spot, like, oh, I could do that. Blank spots are good. And when I have cancellations, you know, I don't celebrate and go, yeah, I, I go, all right, well, that is a block of time that I've just found. I'm not going to fill it up with anything other than a, a calendar block on there. And I'll say, block off. That's, that's the only thing I do. And one of the things I do with my calendar as well is I color code it. A good friend of mine, Virginia, um, taught me this years ago. She said, on your calendar, if you, it doesn't matter if it's paper or electronic, color code things. So, you know, you can glance at it and say, okay, I've got podcast interviews. So I know what color I use for podcast interviews. But for your self-care time or your me time, color that your favorite color. And the reason why you do that is you can look ahead in your calendar and say, okay, I'm not seeing a lot of my favorite color. That's a problem. 
and you can also look back and you know the last couple of weeks or even the last month and go okay do i see enough of my favorite color if you don't then you need to adjust because you're not in balance of your self-care time and your work time because work and you know this has no problem finding time on your calendar not at all it will it it's you know sticks to it like a magnet it goes right there now self-care is something that we try to squeeze in between things you won't do them you won't do them because you're trying to squeeze them in between things those things you're trying to squeeze will expand work will take longer than you think, or an impromptu meeting will pop up. So I always recommend people schedule your self-care times, hopefully consistently, at least through the week. Don't cancel them. Treat them as if they're the most important meeting you've ever had with your boss, because the boss of your life, shoo, you got to do that. Because when you start canceling those things, then all of a sudden, that's when the stress starts building up because you're not taking time off. And then the stress does this. And then congratulations, welcome to Camp Burnout. Uh, you know, you know, the the Tums are over in the corner there. So uh, that's that's big tip. So just, you know, get control of your schedule and really, you know, become crystal clear on how it works for you because everybody's calendar is different, you know, and um, some people may say, I don't ever want to work a Monday ever again in my life as an entrepreneur. Okay, great. Well, then block that off and do the other days, uh, whatever makes sense for you. Yeah, everybody's got different energy levels and things that they can do. Figure what those things are and figure out when you feel like you're in the flow when you're working on certain tasks. And if you see a pattern, you're like, okay, for some reason, Tuesday afternoons, I'm really good at this. Well, then block off your Tuesday afternoons and do those things. It'll just make life so much easier for you. Yeah, thank you. Just tell me a couple of things. I actually delete my calendar stuff when I'm done with them. But now I'm thinking leaving it there because I do the color coding thing. I use the Google Calendar. Mm -hmm. And I actually have my favorite work color in green, but I, I might shift that. because I, I like that idea of making sure the time is there. And you know, this whole idea, you and I have talked about this, the idea of scheduling your life first. I tell people, you know, put mm -hmm. fun before work. Not that right. work can't be fun, but make sure that happens. And I just, <clears throat> I look at this idea of, you know, creating the life you want to create. And it just reminds me of, you know, gosh, Stephen Covey's book, The First Things First, which was a sort of a spinoff of The Seven Habits of a Highly Effective People. Mm -hmm. And that idea that, you know, the whole urgent and important grid and the idea that, you know, the things that are most important, the things like spending time with your kids, your spouse, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your, your family, uh, meditating, taking a walk in the woods, doing stuff you love, whatever it is, those things, they're important, but they're almost never urgent. And the things, and, and, and I think that's actually perhaps maybe get a little metaphysical, maybe maybe that's truer. The important things, maybe they're not urgent, but they, they need to get done on a regular basis. And yet the things that are screaming for your attention, it's almost like, yeah, that almost, it almost seems like they're screaming, at you, like as if they're life or death. And, and as we know, they're not, but when we react right. to them that way, um, then the whole fight or flight response and all those mm -hmm. different things, the amygdala and then just this whole hyper vigilant state happens. Mm -hmm. What would be your sort of big picture? If someone said, okay, look, you have 10, yeah, I don't know, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, a minute to talk with somebody that you feel maybe they're, they're not, um, uh, they're not managing their life as they could be. What questions would you ask them? So in other words, that sort of that intervention, because I'm thinking right now, mm -hmm. if you're talking to the audience and there's, my guess is there's people, especially if somebody, you know, different people stick with different episodes, they listen all the way through and some say, oh, okay. Yeah. Somebody, if they're listening, if you're still listening to this episode, my guess is this is something that's relevant for you. Mm -hmm. So Michael, if that person was in front of you and they're listening because they're wondering, gosh, am I burning out? What questions would you suggest that they ask themselves to, to sort of, in some way self-diagnose or, or get the process started if they need to perhaps do something about that. I think a couple of things. One, um, you know, check on their sleep, you know, how are they sleeping? And uh, I'm a big fan of journaling and I recommend people do that. You can use electric ones. I've got, you know, actually I, you know, I'm tech savvy. I got all kinds of technology and all of that kind of stuff, tablets and laptops and smartphones and all that good stuff. But for my journal, I actually have, you know, a paper and pen uh, type of journal. And you know, I jot things down and I go back and reflect on them, you know, not only you know, periodically, but at, at the end of every year, I look back at the last year of journal notes and see how my life has progressed. And, you know, it's amazing what you forget. And then you look back and like, oh yeah, I remember that period. But, you know, I ask them, you know, how they're, you know, ask them 
they're to ask themselves, how are they sleeping? You know, what's sleep like? Uh, secondly, tying into that, you know, talking to them about, you know, what are things I like doing? You know, what are some of the fun things I get to do? And I like doing, okay, when was the last time you did those things? And if it's been a long time, that's definitely a warning sign. And I know a lot of people say, well, yeah, I'm working so many hours and the lockdown and all of that. And I, I get it. I completely understand. There's a lot of things that I enjoy doing that have been difficult or impossible to do uh, during the pandemic, but there's still a ton of things that I can do. And you know, hone in on those things and do a couple of those things every week. Don't you know, say, okay, once a month I'm going to do this. No, do it every week uh, because we, we go in patterns, we go in rhythms. And if we get on a better rhythm of life feeling better for resting, which is important because we repair the damage we do ourselves on a daily basis. And we do a few things in life that are fun that get us away from the work side of things. Those are two big things to help kind of get the, the stress and the burnout reduced. And then of course, you know, if they're you know, more committed into it, you know, figure out, you know, the nutrition side of things and the activity side of things, because all of those things work together. We're one big complex being, and there's a lot of things going on. And, you know, the food that we eat and the information we consume is fuel. It can either be really good fuel or it can be garbage. And if we consume garbage, well, we're, what are we going to feel like? We're going to feel like garbage. And it's, I'm not telling people to not eat at fast food restaurants anymore or anything like that, but figure out you know, what foods are good for you, make sure you're eating a good, healthy diet for you. Uh, and once you do that, you'll feel better. And then when you feel better, that allows your body that is fighting stress all day long to be able to divert its attention from dealing with all the bad toxin foods that you're eating to focusing on that energy to make you look at a situation, maybe a little less stressful than you are now. And then again, that just has this, you know, evolving effect that can keep you feeling better. But again, going, you know, the 30 second type of thing, just, you know, how, how's, how's sleep life and you know, what are some things you like doing in life? And if you're not doing, if you're not sleeping well and you're not doing things you enjoy doing, uh, that's a very slippery slope that you're going down. Awesome. Thank you. You just mentioned something I forgot is, you know, when you look at nutrition, and that's our physical dimension, usually very tied to how we feel. And people say, okay, look at what you're eating and notice how you feel after. And as somebody with a background in, in psychology, you, know, you tell people, look at the relationships you are emotionally. How do you feel after you connect with those people? Because those things may be not so good. And I think the other thing that a lot of us are learning is also look at the information you're putting in your head. Again, um, I happen to believe, and I'll go a little bit even dabble to be stupid enough to go into the political arena. I think the middle 60 to 80% of us are okay with what's going on in the world. And we understand perspective. And there's an extreme of somewhere between 10 to 20% on both sides. And there might be multiple sides that are really stirring up a lot. And those get clicks, which that's how you and I both know. That's how the web world works. Clicks, you know, the story that says that Michael spent time with his friend today, or Wade spent time coaching his kid at the Y, that doesn't make the news. And that's what's happening a lot of the times in so many parts of the world. What makes the news is the outlandish, sometimes crazy, sometimes stuff that stirs us up. And without, and I don't think either side has got it fully right, because the idea that 45%, I'll talk about America, the idea that 45% of my fellow citizens are idiots or stupid, uh, to me is borders on a little arrogant, as if they have nothing good to offer. Um, right. But just simply looking at it, how do you feel after? Do you feel energized after listening to this show? Uh, we used to call those editorials. Now a lot of them are being called news stations. Mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people I've watched, and, and a lot of people talked about this, you know, the burnout, the wear on the relationships that's come from that. So uh, thank you so much for what you shared. Where can people find out more about your work and connect with what you're up to? Best way to find me is go to breakfastleadership.com. There's all types of resources on my tools and resources page that are free. They can go in, they just enter their name, email, and um, be able to get all of that. Uh, my email address is michael at breakfastleadership.com. Happy to have a conversation with you. I'm on most of the social media channels as well. Uh, the letter B, then fast leadership. Don't put that on a license plate, uh, And but that's a good way to find me as well. Awesome. Yeah, and we'll put all the links and more of the extended bio in the notes. Thanks again for joining us. For everybody listening, really hope you're taking care of yourself. I hope as entrepreneurs, you're not using this unique time right now as a time to 
just say, okay, I've got to just focus and, and do stuff. It's great to say you're accomplishing things. Uh, but as Michael said, you know, make sure you're getting your sleep, make sure you're doing the things you love, spending time with the people you love. If you're not doing that, you know, kind of what we all doing this for. So as always look forward to helping you impact more people and make more money in less time, do what you do best so you can better enjoy your family, your friends and your life. Thanks for listening.